we could end Nehemiah on a high note, but it's pretty tough to do that now. We're at Nehemiah 13, and that's what, see, so you've got that look on your face this morning in your eyes. So I don't know it's contagious. You talked to Barb, and she had it when she came in, and now you got it. I know it. We can, we can trace the roots of this, whatever it is, right back. A little leaven, a little leaven the whole I know, I know, I know. We're going to have to squash it and nip it in the bud. Now we won't. But anyway, yeah. We had an interesting week, and um, I don't remember what I did do this week. <laughs> but so uh, we, we, I, talk, I talked to Shirley one day on the phone, and I had a nice visit with Sheldon again. I had a little bit more time with him up the nursing home, and Alice. And, um, who? Oh, yeah, some of you know, might know Scott Berger, who lives in town. Um, his wife is, if not passed away already, very close to him. Yeah. yeah, they live across, just down from the furniture store and across from the Quickfill, the oh. gas station down there. She's been sick for a very, very long time. Oh. And uh, so we spent some time there this week. It was sort of depressing, actually. <laughs> um, sort of a dark and very dark room. And the poor old man is. Every breath was a chore. Was, uh, and the uh, doctors only gave her a couple of days to survive. So uh, all the family were able to get there by um, Thursday, Thursday night, I think. Some of them were overseas, all the children. I had Scott was our paper boy for a while when we lived in Geneseo. We had a house in Geneseo. That was before they got wise to us and said, you got to leave town. And they let all the outlaws into Groveland. But uh, that's, uh, and we know his dad, or his, his mother, and his stepdad very well. Your city is their name again. Burger. Burger. Stop Burger. His wife's name is Amy. Amy? Yes. And uh, I actually had, when I taught in Dansville 150 years ago, she was actually one of my students, so we go back quite a ways. It's sad to see her so desperately and deathly ill, but um, yeah. But anyway, yeah, it's been a good week, and I'm excited to be here because there's all sorts of neat stuff going. I've been thinking about this. I've kind of been um, batting ideas around in my head, and I'm thinking, you know, um, the fact that you are all here. And the church continues, despite the trials and tribulations you've been through, God has still got something up his sleeve here. I really believe he has something up his sleeve. I, I just waiting to see what the next thing is going to be. And that's kind of exciting for me. Um, I think he, God wants to use this church in ways it hasn't been used in a few years because of all the challenges you've been through. So I'm always excited to think about what, as I pray, what has God got up his sleeve? And um, awesome. it, it is awesome right now because people like you folks are here and faithful. You haven't just said, you know, there's only a few of us. We're all getting older. We might just well close the door and go somewhere else. You know? Um, but you haven't done that. That's, that's the stuff that amazes me. That just blesses me. But last Sunday uh, after church was a blessing, though. That was one mighty fine time of fellowship. I got to tell you that. We appreciate it, Bill Babs and I. It's just fun to visit with you all. You're so interesting people. So, anyway, Nehemiah 13. This is the last chapter of Nehemiah. And uh, if you were superstitious, you'd say, oh, it shouldn't end on the number 13. But it does. And it's not a good chapter. I would have been happy if it would have ended a chapter or two earlier. Because chapter 13 is, is dismal. 
after all this time, Nehemiah has been such a stalwart, faithful man, restoring the wall, restoring the innards of Jerusalem, restoring the people to faithfulness. And here we find out that Nehemiah has, oh, incidentally, before I begin, this quote by General William Booth, you know who he is, everyone, right? No? He is the founder of the Salvation Army. A very interesting man. And he writes, and I like this quote, it works for this, bear in mind that it is the nature of a fire to go out. And if anybody keeps a wood stove these days, you know you can keep throwing wood in, but you gotta keep throwing wood in if you're gonna have a fire. You must keep it stirred and fed and the ashes removed. And this is a chapter uh, 13 about just exactly that. And that's kind of sets the tone. Nehemiah uh, returns to his king in Assyria. And in, after a time, he asks permission of that king if he can return to Jerusalem. We don't know exactly how long the time has been since he's left Jerusalem, gone back to Assyria, then come back. But we know it's probably at least a year and probably longer. But um, there's some debate about that. But unfortunately, when he gets back to Jerusalem, now think about this. Put yourself in Nehemiah's shoes. You rebuilt the holy wall around a holy city and got the people back into the Word. Remember last week, they all uh, made a vow, a covenant, a binding agreement that they would do everything that's in the scriptures. And he left them in good shape and he said, priests, he's consecrated this and that. And said, this is what you're supposed to do as priests. Don't goof up. Um, this is what the people are supposed to do. Don't goof up. Do according to what God has told you to do. This is really simple. All you have to do is do what God told you to do. You've got the book. If you have a question about it, Ezra and the priest will tell you what the book says so you can go ahead and do what God wants us to do. Be obedient. Unfortunately, Nehemiah gets back and number one, he returns and he finds the whole outfit from top to bottom plunged into sin. That this binding agreement we looked at last week is long forgotten. They just abandon it and decide to do their own thing. And so when Nehemiah comes back, he's like, you know, he's ready to pull his hair out, literally. In fact, if we find out in this chapter, he's so mad he pulls other people's hair out, literally. Which I appreciate. And I almost got into trouble last night. I was going to see this. Thank goodness. Because she would pinch me or kick me under the table. She's good at kicking me under the table, by the way, and I'm supposed to know what she means. And, but after you've been married 50 years, you're supposed to know what a kick under the table means. Uh, I didn't. It was about dessert. Ah, uh, yes. So uh, I'm in, uh, we're waiting in line at this steakhouse, um, and, and, and we're next to go. And this guy comes up behind me, he's an African-American, he's got hair that goes, Why? <laughs> and I was, you know me, I just couldn't resist. And I figured that's the kind of thing that starts a race riot when some old white guy says something to a young black guy. And so I couldn't help but it happened just like the spontaneous, there was no discipline to my tongue whatsoever. And I said, wow, is that cool hair. <laughs> This young guy who looks at me, <laughs> he was, yeah, he, 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 I said, so then I realized, oh heck, I probably shouldn't have said anything, he's, he's, you know, so then I said, but then again, I appreciate anybody with hair. <laughs> no, he was completely taken back, some old white guy would speak to him, but uh, I said, so then I could see, he's, I made him smile. And I said, well, maybe you could, you got stuff to spare there, but I cut off some and blew it on here, you know, that was humor. <laughs> and then before I got myself into any more trouble, we went and sat down at the table where Bev started kicking me. But, 
There was one thing I didn't know what it meant, though. You kicked me once during the meal, and I, I couldn't I could translate it. I was hungry. What am I doing talking about that? Oh, here. Well, let's take a look at Nehemiah. In 1a, as we look at this, as we look at verses 4 and 5, something happens here, and it starts at the top. You know, um, rot will happen if the top is rotten, particularly in the leadership. We see it in politics, we see it in business, and sometimes we see it in churches, where the people at the top lose their way, they lose their discipline, and they operate on the basis of their own interests. And that's what happens here in verses, uh, what did I say, 4 and 5. Let's read them. And before this, Eliashib, the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of God, was allied with Tobiah. Does anybody remember the name Tobiah from earlier in the book of Nehemiah? No? Remember the name from somewhere. Yeah, well, that's not a name you'd name your cat, Tobiah. But... Okay. Well, I think I'm going to need some help here. I don't know what has gotten into these people. Tobiah. Joe's smirking back there. He knows what it is. Yeah, and San Palais. Yes, remember those two rotten dudes? They were, he gets a gold star. Pay more attention to Marlo. Okay. <laughs> We're going to have to put you in the corner. <laughs> Sam Belay and Tobiah were the bad guys who were kings of these city states that surrounded Jerusalem and they threatened Nehemiah during the building of the wall. Uh, they insulted him, they baited him, and they actually tried to trick him into a, uh, a trap in which they would have taken his life. He was wise to it because of God's guidance and wisdom, and uh, he avoided that, completed the wall, but yet these were bad guys. These were not Hebrew people. And so what does Eliashib do? He is allied with Tobiah. Now the chief priest should not have anything to do with these guys. Nehemiah made that very plain. Tobiah didn't, out of the goodness of his heart, all of a sudden decide he was going to start following Jehovah and then move into Jerusalem. That's not the case. There's no record of any kind of transformation on his part. But what happens is, Eliashib, the head priest here, decides that he can make up his own rules. And so he allows this Tobiah into the temple. In fact, as we find in the next verse, and Eliashib had prepared for him Tobiah a great chamber where after time they had laid the meat offerings and frankincense and the vessels and the ties of corn, the new wine and the oil, which commanded, was commanded to be given to the Levites, to the singers and the porters and the offerings of the priests. So what he does, Eliashib, he partners with Tobiah and he desecrates the temple. He desecrates the temple. He just, any sanctity, any holiness that the temple naturally should represent and stand for, it should be the rock of the Hebrews' faith, is now desecrated by sin. A sinful man in a sinful alliance. And Nehemiah comes along and he can't believe it. How could you do such a thing? It looks like it's just a room in the temple, but it says in verse 5, a great chamber. It's a, it's a huge space. And it was used for holy things, for the sacrifices. And putting a sinful king 
installing him in the temple like this is just an offense to God and Nehemiah, is, his mind is just blowing up and this is only the first of a bunch of things. How could this be? How difficult is it to be faithful? And you would think the chief priest of all the people would have more motivate, motivation to be holy and to be obedient and to do what God commands, but he didn't. And so what happens is their solution. Nehemiah comes along, you see, Nehemiah is a man of action. He's, he doesn't just say, there's no record here of, of him saying, well, let's have a committee meeting. Let's, let's talk to Eliashib and see if we can work out some sort of arrangement. Let's see if, uh, well, let's see. Maybe he doesn't want to talk about it. Let's pray about it. There's no indication he has to pray about it. Why? Because the sin is so right in your face. He's got to act decisively. It doesn't mean that he doesn't necessarily has not prayed for it. And he may have talked to other people. But he is a man of action, a man of faith. And with this blatant sin, that desecrates the temple, offends God, and leads the whole nation of Israel into sin, he has to act. And this is what he does in verses 8 and 9. It says, And it grieved me sore, therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Now I can just see this in doing this. He's just in there and he's mad as he can be. You know, oftentimes, um, people have told me that they have this righteous anger. Most of the time, like 99.999% of the time, it's just anger. And you're a Christian trying to justify being mad over something. Uh, as opposed to balancing it with the other scriptures that say you shouldn't. But Nehemiah has a bout of righteous anger. And he charges into the temple and he starts heaving stuff out. Can you believe it? I love this man. He's like, I'm a man of action. We can't tolerate this. You want to give me a hand? That's fine. I'll throw it all out myself. And I'll throw Tobiah out if he shows up. He's never coming back here. Don't let him in. Don't touch any of his stuff. Don't talk to him. Don't negotiate with him. Your job is to be obedient to Jehovah. That's all your job is, priest. That's all you have to do. This is simple. This is not brain surgery. This is not complicated. You just have to know scriptures, that's your job, and do what it says. Instead, you make this unholy alliance. So he throws everything out of this grand room, and he returns everything that was the holy vessels and everything else uh, what priests should have been using in this room. He restores it to the way it looked prior to Tobiah. And then, in verse 8 and 9... Would you go back up to A and tell us what oh, it was Oh, yes, I'd be glad to, Shirley. Um, in A, Eliashib, the priest, partners with Tobiah and desecrates not only a room in the temple, this grand room, but the whole temple is desecrated because of this one room. Which, by the way, is an interesting, as we said it humorously earlier, a little loving loves a whole lot. You desecrate one room in the temple, you desecrate them all. If sin happens within a church and the church doesn't address it, it begins to affect the whole church, not just the people involved. That's why sin particularly in the church, is so critical to recognize. And what a challenge it is these days because nobody wants, not really anybody, wants to confront the sin in another's life because it sounds judgmental. But yet, if the pastor, the elders, the deacons do not address evident sin, the sin itself will ruin a whole church. Because a sin in one or two people will leaven a whole bunch. It's an important, important principle. I'm glad you made me go back to that, 
show. Thank you. At any rate, the solution is, of course, he throws everything out, puts everything back in place, and purifies the robes. The next thing he sees <laughs> is even more unsettling. As we follow along, it says, the people were not giving the obligatory portions to the Levites, and the house of God was neglected. I say it again, the people were not giving the obligatory portions to the Levites. In other words, the Levites were responsible for keeping the law, keeping the record of the law, reading it and knowing it and teaching the people. That was their job. They were not to go out and be farmers. But that's exactly what was going on. Because the people were not supplying the necessary survival foods, they had to go out and begin cultivating the land in order to survive, which was not what they were supposed to do. So, uh, again, the people, you start at the top of the priest, it works down to the people in general that they were just not doing what they were supposed to do. You're supposed to bring your tithes into the house of God. You don't play games um, with God or His appointed priests. You're supposed to take care of them. And they weren't. And so, Nehemiah has to deal with this in verses 12 and 13. Um, he says, Then all Judah and the tithe of the corn and the new wine and the oil unto the treasuries. He set them in place. In other words, he brought all Judah the tithe. They had to bring their tithes. You neglected God and God's appointed priests by not giving the portion that they're God entitled to because that's what God said to do. You better do it. And so he calls uh, the people together and he says, you bring the stuff that you should have been bringing, your grain, the oil, the wine, and other food stuffs. You bring them like you're supposed to. Knock it off. Be obedient. It wasn't so long. I bet I could go back in the records and find your name where you had a binding agreement with one another, the priest that God made, that you would do these things that God commanded. Here I come back and you're not doing any of them. Can you just say, this, this, is, this is a righteous anger rising. This is a real righteous anger. He's, he's mad and he's grieved. But it's not grief like he experienced at the beginning of the book, in chapter 1, remember, where he, he fasts and mourns and weeps for nearly a month and a half trying to figure out what to do. He's so upset about it. Now he's upset for another reason because this is before there were sheep without a shepherd. Now they have, the sheep have the shepherds and the shepherds let them down. I'll tell you, there's nothing more dangerous than a man who presumes the call of God in his life, or a woman, to be a shepherd. And by that I mean not only a pastor, but I mean, as we know, so many ladies are missionaries overseas. You take somebody like Sarah Wetmore. She does a whole lot more than just administer medical. <coughs> But if you presume to accept that call in your life, that responsibility is holy and it's always with you. You're responsible to be obedient to God's word and you're responsible to make sure God's people knows it. That is God's word. And where there's sin, you need to address it. If you don't, you're in trouble with God. And I, for one, don't like getting in trouble with God. So what he has to do next is he said in verse 13, and made treasures over the treasury. In other words, they weren't even keeping track of stuff. There was, there was no accounting. And as he goes on to them and he says at the bottom here, they were counted faithful. These were people who he had to install and their office was to distribute unto their brethren. He had to go and find some guys who were not in a responsible position, who were responsible, that he could trust 
to distribute the tithes that were coming back into the temple. Man, did he have his work cut out. You know, if, he, if a guy was ever frustrated, this had to be it. And he's not done yet. Next one. In C, in verses 15 and 16. Now this is really interesting because now he's really mad. He was mad before, but now he's really mad. And he says, in those days, verses 6, 15 and 16, saw I and Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and ladling asses and also wine grapes and figs and all manner of birds which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day written they sold victuals. You don't do commerce on Sunday. We don't hold to that as strictly as we used to. Uh, you remember growing up that there weren't any stores open on Sunday. There are things called blue laws. And if you thought you needed something Sunday, you best go get something on Saturday. And if you didn't get it on Saturday, you didn't have it for Sunday. Because there's nothing open. And that was those were those were the days, you know. When we were kids, it's like, well, I'll go to the gas station. No. Nope. I get a candy bar, get some pop or an ice cream. The gas station was closed on Sunday. And it was like, wow, what's happened in the last 50 years? We couldn't even play baseball. So yeah. Yeah. The first, the, the church I grew up in was very conservative, the, the fundamental church, and you kept your Sunday clothes on all day, and you, you, you didn't do that kind of activity. You didn't play athletic games. You didn't do those kinds of things. Um, I think it was, was, I bought into that because I was a brand new Christian and I was 16, so it wasn't a big deal. And there were actually kids in the church, not many of them, who were my age, so I got to hang out with them, which was a pretty good deal, actually, for me. <laughs> but, and then something happened in our culture, right? I think it was called Wegmans. <laughs> and now, you can get up 24 hours a day and go shopping in Wegmans, seven days a week, even although Christmas hours are probably shortened. But now you can, you can, you can, uh, we went past the mall last night. And I'm thinking, if the malls were closed today, you wouldn't have been able to get off whatever that road is, 590 or 390 or whatever. You couldn't have got off it because the cars would be backed up because there wouldn't be any room in the parking lot for people to park. And just mobbed, absolutely mobbed. And I bet you today, the parking lots of those places are mobbed again. Nobody thinks about keeping the Sabbath holy. So he finds these guys, the people again. You see, the people again. They won't bring the tithes to the temple, but they'll bring their produce into the temple to get sold. It was a day of merchandising. It was like, hey, hey, yeah, I can see the flyer now. Come and you know, buy two vials of grape oil for uh, and, you know, with this coupon. Or if it would have been TV, you know, like I was watching TV this morning, you know, you can get all sorts of things on TV in the middle of the night, which is oftentimes when I'm only watching TV because I'm awake at the night. And it's like, you can buy everything under the sun in the middle of the night. And there's always a bargain if you call now within five minutes. <laughs> Two for one. Two for one, yes, yes. We'll double that offer if you call within five minutes. Free shipping. Free, <laughs> free shipping. And, you know, it just gets rocking and rolling. And you're thinking, geez, that's pretty cool. I, I might try this one. It looks pretty cheap. You can give the other one for a cheap gift. But I've never done that. But it's an idea. It's an idea, yeah, yeah. Well, if I ever order one done, I'll get an extra for that. Okay. Okay. I'll double my offer. Pillows, oh yeah. I have one. You have one more. I have pillows, yeah. I do. And I love them. Yeah. I see. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> you know what kind of pillow I get in my house? My wife got one of those pillows, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I got? An old 
junky pillow you have here. <laughs> you put your head on it, and if your ear gets folded over like this, it's like three or four hours in the morning before that ear comes back. It's just like sleeping on a hunk of rock. Or... Well, I made it Well, that's even plus, better than a twofer. Plus four nights. <laughs> plus eight nights. Were they eating the pillows?
And then he goes one more in section D, verses 23 through 27. I just, uh, in the interest of time, simply say, uh, they desecrate the purity of Judah by unholy marriages. I think I alluded to this last week. This is, this is the slippery slope that increases the incline. It really does. And I'm talking about, it's an incline that uh, once you get sliding, you just don't stop. And so he is, he is, he is just livid with rage. You know why? Because he discovers as he listens to these people that they're speaking within the walls of Jerusalem, not Hebrew, but some foreign language. That the children of Hebrews, a mixed marriage between a Hebrew and a, a non-Hebrew, the children are not speaking Hebrew. They're speaking the native language of the non-Hebrew people. And so they don't even understand the language. They don't have any heritage. Language unifies people, always. <coughs> always, or disunifies, in this particular case. He gets so mad, as it says later on here, he, uh, he, he pulls out the hair of some of these people. He's so angry, he's just not having it. You think you're getting away with this stuff? Well, maybe you got away with it with Eliashib and some of the priests, but you ain't getting away with it with me. This is serious business. I can see this guy grabbing somebody by the hair, kicking him in the rear end, and throwing him down a flight of stairs and saying, get yourself straight, you're sinful, and you caused the whole nation to go into decline. Do you want to be carried off into captivity again? Did you learn anything? What is it wrong with you? How can you be so stupid? Here I come back and I find the whole country in disarray again. How is that possible? He tells them, that's it. I don't, I don't know how you solve this one. There really is a multiple solution, but this is what he says in 25b. He says, I made him swear by God, saying, You shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons, or for yourselves. He's saying, no, -uh. no more mixed marriages. You know, I know there are occasions, it, even in our contemporary situation, where Christians marry non-Christians. And they're in love, and that works. Kind of, sort of. But it's a rarity when the Christian partner brings the non-Christian partner to Christ. Quite frankly. And I know, I don't, I don't know thousands of them, but I know enough of them from my own experience that it's usually the other way. The non-Christian takes the Christian away from Christ. Pretty much always the way it is. Not every time. In those times when the non-Christian comes to Christ is a pretty wonderful thing. That's a miracle of the grace of God. And we praise God for that. Anyway, he uh, he throws him he throws him down. <laughs> I love what he says in 26 at the end. In the very last phrase, nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. He's talking about Solomon. <laughs> he says. Those crazy non-Hebrew women, they even caused Solomon to sin, and he was supposed to be the wisest guy, and he blew it too. All over none. Listen, marry a woman who is a Hebrew. Listen, if you're a Christian, marry a woman who is a Christian. A died in the wool, track record, trustworthy partner who loves Christ. Don't compromise on it ever, ever, ever. Because it will take him in a place away from God and not toward God. The last one, uh, the, the, the whole priesthood is defiled. And uh, in verse 28, and he has to go back to square one. It, it's interesting here in this outline, chapter 13 is bookended by priests who go astray and priests who go astray. He's got his work cut out for him. He has to reestablish a whole righteous order. And the difficulty that faces him for doing that. And tries his best. And here 
And here in the last verse, verse 31, um, I can, maybe it's, I'm reading too much into it, but I sort of identify with Nehemiah at this point, excuse me, at this point, because if you're, every, excuse me, every pastor runs into this from time to time where you work your heart out and you don't seem to get anywhere. You don't see the kind of fruit that endures. You, you, you just, I'm not talking about me in here. I'm talking about when I was at campus, you worked so hard and it just didn't seem like you were gaining on it. That you were always after kids not to, they, I had kids who would come to the Friday night university gathering and they'd sing praise and worship, we'd hear a strong gospel message and then as soon as it was over, they'd go to a frat party. What's the deal with that? Or <clears throat> even Christians, they would come to, they would do, they would be small group leaders, and then I get wind of well, Sarah and Sarah and, uh, and and JT are, are, are sharing the same apartment. What? So I go and ask them, why are you doing this? Well, we're not doing anything. I said, oh yeah, do I have stupid written all over my face? Come on, you're 20 years old, I know about being 20. I may not look it, but I do have a vague memory. And if nothing else, it takes on the appearance of evil and it disrespects the girl and it disrespects God, not God. <coughs> well, okay, if you say so. I said, give me your cell phone number. And I would call, you remember, I called JT at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> JT, I, I didn't care whether I woke him up or not, he was bugging me. I said, JT, where are you? Oh, 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 Pastor Dave, I'm just leaving Sarah's apartment. What are you doing there at 2 o'clock in the morning? You get your butt back down to your campus room. Don't you go there again. I called another two or three nights, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. JT, this is Pastor Dave. Where are you? Oh, I'm just leaving Sarah's right now. Okay, I want to meet you tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock in the bottom of Schrader Gym. You'll be going to have a nose to nose. <coughs> they didn't like that. Sarah and JT, I married them. And um, they, they uh, have a solid Christian marriage. And they have a family of their own they're working on. So I'm not sure I had too much to do with it, but I, I know you can't let that kind of stuff slide. You just can't. So anyway, what he says in verse 31, he's, it's almost a prayer. He's saying to God, Remember me, oh my God, for good. I tried the best I could. I did the best I could. And it didn't take. I'm sorry. And I'm broken hearted about it. But don't forget that I tried real hard. I tried to do the right thing. I tried to stand up for your name, holiness. And that's the call of each of us. To stand up for you righteousness and holiness and to live that kind of holy life. Let's pray for you. Father, bless us, if you would please, this morning. Help us to be Nehemiahs and not the sheep that just follow after our own sinful desires. Help us to be men and women of righteousness, of holiness, of obedience, to have no quarter with sin whatsoever in our lives. And that's tough, and we need your help. We need the presence of the Holy Spirit, always giving us godly counsel, holy counsel that says, stay away from this or get away from that, because it will injure you. Help us to follow hard after you in obedience. We thank you for Nehemiah, for the example he is to us, a tireless worker. He resembles, these people resemble Nehemiah in so many different ways tireless, faithful workers doing the very best they can to honor you. And I pray because they have been faithful and steadfast that you will honor them by taking us in new places, exciting places as we follow hard after you. For we come to you in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen.